and I first got here we closed at six o'clock on Friday and Saturday and open to eight or sometimes 10 p.m. during the week and now our department is responsible for having the building open around the clock five days a week. At the circulation desk we also do the reserves and in about 1996 we started a pilot project for electronic reserves. That's where we digitize materials that the faculty want to use and have everyone can have uh, electronic access to their reserve readings. And we have just this last semester instituted a new electronic reserves product called ARIES that is really exciting for me because it includes uh, project management software. One of the big changes that I've found very um, interesting and important is that the scatter room used to be so far away from the circulation desk and that has been improved a lot because I think the shelving department needs to work as a team with the uh, circulation desk because we don't only shelve the uh, books that are being returned but also the books that are being used in-house. One of my first memories of Fondren is walking into the old, you know, through, through the entrance and into that old huge reading room that we used to have with the circulation desk right across from the entrance and the reference desk on the right and uh, then of course the card catalog that archaic uh, uh, institution, um, and the, the look of the building because it was, for one thing, it was a huge big space in there, and it was, uh, the walls were blonde wood paneling and covered in leather, and the floor was covered in cork tiling, and it, it was a little bit sagging at that point in 1983. The time that I started here, there were no computers on the desk whatsoever. We had one large Philips MyCom word processor. So we used to have one word processing machine that had um, these really large, like 32 inch floppy drives. But we had typewriters on our desk at that time and continued that for a couple of years until we did get PCs. One funny thing that happened to me during that time was, I believe it was October of 85, uh, during an inauguration of George Rupp. I was the only one left in RICE to answer the phones at that time. And um, a gentleman, and se well, several gentlemen came up to me and uh, asked me if I could open the door to Woodson Research Center, which at the time RICE was located right down the hall from uh, the Woodson. And I said, no. I can't do that, I don't have a key, I'm just here answering the phones, and he said, well, I've got to get in that room, and I said, well, let me call the campus police to let you in, and he said, no, we don't have time for that. We have to change into our regalia, and we have to be, you know, in this procession, and I said, well, what do you want me to do? I don't know what you want me to do, I mean, I can't. You know, I, I don't have a key, and he said, well, you're going to have to climb through the window to open the door, and I said, Mm, okay. <laughs> but anyway, as a result, I did climb through the window. I was much younger and a lot more thinner then. <laughs> so I climbed through the window and opened the door, later to find out that it was actually George Rupp. RICE stands for Regional Information and Communication Exchange, and it was a fee-based information service that uh, we provided research information for the business community. Um, but back in 2003, it actually closed. When I arrived, our department was in the back of the first floor area. And uh, very shortly after I arrived, we were moved to the basement. Part of our charge was to uh, uh, pay for ourselves. We had to, had to generate the income that, was, that covered our expenses. And back then, the librarian was uh, Sam Carrington. I vividly remember him walking through our department one, every once in a while saying, making any money? In his uh, fairly thick, I think, North Carolina accent. And he wouldn't stop even really to hear if we were making any money, but he was always walking through saying, making any money? <laughs> in 1985, the library purchased an integrated library system called MODIS, which was used for all our library functions, ordering, cataloging, circulation, and so on. In August 1995, we moved to the Searcy system. When I first started uh, working at the reference desk in 1985, we were just bringing up the online catalog. 
which um, at that time was notice. And we had the cards, the information on the screen we tried to have look just like the card catalog card so people would be able to make that transition from print to electronic with you know, labeling things subject, heading, title, author. And um, now we've really looked a lot more at interfaces and we have focus groups and lots of assessment to be sure that people can find things. At the reference desk, we used to have one OCLC terminal and um, you had to search it with using um, three letters. To do a title search, it was three letters, comma, two letters, comma, two letters, and then one which was really not you know, a very friendly interface. And I, I just think how easy it is now for people to put in sort of natural language searches and come back with lots of information. Another thing that's really changed is after a couple years, we bought one PC that we, we shared with the Woodson Research Center. Um, and we did online searches on this, this terminal that were mediated between a librarian and a person. You know, we would interview a person and they would tell you what they were looking for and then you would kind of lay out your search strategy and um, we would search these databases for them and then move the computer back into the reference office at night on this book truck and I remember one night one of the wheels fell off the book truck and um, you know the screen dropped the monitor and it was just this really big ordeal. <laughs> uh, the science librarians John Hunter and Charles Myers actually did mediated um, database searches which were paid for by grants from the various science departments. This was through Dialog and BRS. Uh, by the mid-80s, um, those um, companies began to think of the end user as a clientele and started marketing things like BRS After Dark and Knowledge Index. But still, we were charging the students a flat uh, rate for an hour's worth of search. And of course today we have literally hundreds of data subscriptions to databases that the faculty and students take for granted. They, they can search them from their desktop or from home. Online searching was not free. You based on connect time, you based on the number of documents that was retrieved, and so we did that. But we tried to find downtime and what happened, the vendors recognized that they could get more bangs for their bucks when they start offering the searching at non-prime time, as we call it. So when we do searching, our little office was really glassed and closed. And many times, you start doing searching, and you'd have patients banging on the window, wanting help. But when you're on the clock doing searching, uh, you really could not stop. Another, of course, is the Googleization of, uh, of research. and. Um, when I first came in previous library jobs, we had to do, if somebody was interested in finding out about things online, we would do a search for them. And, um, or people would use print indexes. Now because of Google, people, we have sort of another job which is to, to try to teach students um, that, you know, to be selective about what they find in Google and that there are other ways to maybe find more legitimate materials. So now everybody's an expert and um, it's, it's a little more challenging in a way because you have to convince them that there is something for them to learn.